velkommen. Alle må sette seg ned og være helt stille, for nå begynner vi. Eh, og de som ikke har satt seg ennå, så er det plasser her borte. Eh, så slipper dere å stå eller sitte langt bak. Eh, hjertelig velkommen. Dette møte kommer vi til å ha på engelsk. Eh, så da bare sier jeg god morgen og velkommen. Welcome to the first breakfast meeting of this year. We have much more to offer in the coming weeks. Already next week we are looking back at a year with Donald Trump. Uh, on the 23rd we're kicking off the quiz season and all of it here at Kulturuse. So follow us on Facebook and uh, we'll let you know what's happening. Um, it's a great honor to host this meeting jointly with the Gates Foundation. Um, our hope for this year is that People and policy will look beyond ourselves, beyond borders. I think we can all agree that we need strong international institutions and equitable distribution more each year. And I'm pleased also to announce that this year agenda is really stepping up our work on international development. We'll be working on international taxation, on effective financing of international developments. We'll be celebrating the anniversary of the Global Seed Vault. Um, We'll be working on global equity and Norwegian development priorities and many other things. Um, we have to that end recruited no less than two superb new colleagues that will start between now and April. Um, and we look forward also to be discussing with many of you in the months to come. Um, today, we are kicking it all off with a topic that I think everyone can relate to. Um, good health and access to health services is crucial to poverty reduction. Um, and global health, I think, also provides us with ample proof that development works. Uh, we've seen great success in global health during the last 20 years. And when the Millennium Development Goals were set in 2000, many believed it was too optimistic. Yet, um, according to the UN, the global under five mortality has declined more than half between 1990 and 2015. And for good reason, various Norwegian governments across political affiliations have given high priority to global health for a long period. Um, the funding will reach about $500 million in 2018, which is twice the level of 2012, I am told. Um, and Norwegian health aid is primarily channeled through global actors, such as UN organizations, the World Bank, Gavi, and the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Um, 640 million children have been immunized by Gavi since the alliance was launched in 2000. And according to the World Health Organization, Gavi has over time averted more than 9 million deaths. Yet, despite successes, the job is far from finished. And I think the Ebola outbreak and other outbreaks in recent years show, has shown us that threats to health know no borders and that the risk of major outbreaks affect us all and are particularly severe in fragile countries that lack institutions. And today, about 400 million people lack access to essential health services. So today we ask, first, what are the main gaps and challenges globally? Um, and where should Norway, as a small country with a relatively large assistant budget, actually direct it aid, its aid to make a difference? Can we add any value beyond funding? Um, and to kick this all up, to wake you up, to scare you a little bit, and also to ground the discussion, take all the fluffy terminology out of it, I have asked two experts from two of the biggest and most, most professional NGOs that we have in Norway to, to help us identify the job at hand. So please welcome to the stage Kjersti Koffeldt from uh, uh, Red, Red Barna and Lisa Sivertsen from the Norwegian Church Aid. Welcome. Welcome. So I want to start with you, Lisa. I've asked uh, both of you to, to prepare sort of some main challenges and gaps and the most difficult things that we haven't fixed. Uh, and what are they? Um, uh, thank you for inviting us. And uh, even though it's early and cold, we have coffee. And I'm really happy to be here <laughs> and discuss this uh, important issue that has a huge impact uh, on so many people. So um, I think uh, many of you will agree with me that the biggest challenge that we see uh, and the one that creates the biggest gaps is inequality. The fact that who you are, where you live, 
what gender you have, who's y who your family is, um, what kind of ethnic or religious identity you have, largely actually dictates what kind of health services you get. Um, this is well documented by um, the WHO, the World Bank, UNDP, and it should not be underestimated by anyone, I think. Uh, we simply cannot meet the SDG on health uh, without uh, interlinking the interventions with the efforts on the SDG on inequality. Could I give you just a really brief example? Yes, please. I've been working on health uh, services in uh, Rwanda, uh, where they have this excellent program. They actually target the uh, poorest individuals and households to provide uh, free, um, uh, cost-free health services. You just need to have this ID card, uh, and you can actually go to the nearest clinic and get uh, free health services. Problem was, people didn't. Uh, there were some sort of communities and households that did not do this, even though this is a really good, I think, good policy. Um, so we looked into why, and we discovered two things, and this was very sensitive and very difficult to talk about. First thing was, uh, a lot of these communities and individuals could not afford uh, to take the photo to get the identity card. Uh, and the second was that they were also really scared of being harassed at a health clinic because of uh, this was a, uh, these were some of the groups that had been uh, discriminated against earlier. So there, you know, this is really basic, but I think unless you have the political will, uh, the money, uh, and you do the, the normative work as well that you need to actually reach out to these people with designated, targeted interventions, we will never be able to reach them. Thank you. Uh, Justin. Um, thanks for welcome or for being here and, and welcome all of you also. But I think what you're pointing to is really key, that we really need to think about inequality in this. And I think that's one of the main issues that we saw lagging behind from the MDG area is how do we work with health system strengthening? And I think that's my first point and challenge uh, to the international community, really, that we know, um, and there is this concern that the MDG goals really led to uh, creating silos that overlook the broader needs of stronger health systems. And given the reliance on many poor countries on aid, that uh, has helped to make health systems fragmented. So, uh, for instance, my colleagues in Malawi, they tell me how support from the Global Fund uh, to fight AIDS, malaria, and TB has led to setting up parallel data systems within the health sector. So you would actually have one section of the Ministry of Health um, using one system of data collection uh, with these global fund uh, money from the Global Fund to collect data on HIV indicators. While um, at the same time, these same facilities where they collect these indicators, they use a different data system to collect other uh, indicators on maternal, newborn, and child health. That's, that's an issue. And I think uh, just rightly what you pointed to with the Ebola outbreak in 2014 and 2015, it really clearly showed us how dramatic the consequences of weak health systems can be. And um, there is a broad agreement that the Ebola crisis was not quickly uh, contained, reversed, or mitigated because the national health system in these countries were dangerously under-resourced, understaffed, and poorly equipped. But I think the key thing to keep in mind with this is that this inability to cope with a major epidemic outbreak also reflect a similar inability to cope with the daily health needs of the population in these countries. And then when you think about the fact that there are still six million children dying, or nearly six million children dying every year of uh, preventable causes. Um, and of these children, Nearly half of them die within the first month of life. And if we are going to prevent these deaths, what we need to do is really require that every birth is to be supported by good quality healthcare. So um, further progress in reducing child mortality will require stronger health systems, and vaccines alone won't do that. So we're not reaching the poorest, and we don't build institutions sufficiently. Those are two. Uh, two things. Yeah. That it? Uh, no, there are more things. <laughs> and I think, um, so um, you briefly talked about uh, moving from the SDGs, uh, no, from the MDGs to the SDGs. And the SDG 3 on health is a lot broader and a holistic one. Um, and for instance, uh, target 3.8 in, in the SDG 3 points to universal uh, health coverage, that you're going to access health uh, services of good quality uh, without, with financial risk protection. 
And this is going to cost money. Uh, so I think the second challenge that I really want to, to point to is that we need to move the agenda from funding to financing. Uh, so um, the most recent numbers from WHO states that reaching SDG 3 would require new investments increasing over time from an initial 134 billion USD annually to 371 billion annually by 2030. And um, that's a lot of money. So we can talk a lot about development assistance to health, but that's just a tiny piece of it. So the total expenditure of, uh, on health in the world is 7.3 billion USD. No, uh, trillion, sorry, trillion USD. And of that, it's only 0.3%, which is actually eight. Mm. So we're talking lots of money. So how are we going to solve this? And I think this, um, we need to really shift and talking about financing instead, and we're going to do this in a fair and a progressive manner. And I think this is a a uh, really good challenge where Norway can step up and do something more, and that's what has, what has to do with tax. Uh, Panama, pa Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers clearly showed us that we need to think about tax in a different manner. So I think uh, Norway should step up and really take a leadership role when it comes to curbing illicit financial flows. It has to be a key part of cr increasing developing countries' national resources. Uh, and Norway must also dare to point the finger towards ourselves and other governments of the global north. So, uh, as we know, the, I mean, the global tax-related rules set by northern governments and institutions, they still have large loopholes that allow massive illicit capital flows out of developing countries. So changing that is definitely a necessary part of increasing domestic resources for health in developing countries. Thank you. Did you have anything to add? Uh, yes, I think building on that, uh, I have this concern as well, and I think this is a really alarming trend, and I think that is, has to do with the relationship between the nation state and the private sector, because uh, the power <laughs> balance is definitely shifting. Uh, and I, I, I strongly believe that um, the private sector is a key player and is needed and has a lot to contribute with. We see this, and I think this is, uh, this is um, and we need the private sector. Uh, but I also strongly believe that the, the state should be the primary provider of health services and the one that is responsible to, uh, for building these uh, health systems that we need uh, financed uh, uh, sustainable, uh, sustainably. Um, I fear that the nation state is largely becoming unable to regulate and control especially the big multinational companies and they are investing heavily in uh, medical technology and medical research at the moment and I think they will have a huge impact on the health services of all of us in the future including uh, marginalized people. So really the nation state need to step up to regain some of that control and I think that's a big challenge. Norway cannot do it on its own but we need politicians that are dedicated and working on this together I think. This is a really, really key challenge for the future. Mm. Okay, I think we have something to work on. Um, we need to make sure the marginalized and poorest people actually get access. Uh, we're concerned about uh, building institutions instead of duplicating them, uh, mobilizing domestic funds, really, by avoiding um, uh, capital flights, and then, in addition, regulating while also uh, benefiting from the presence of the private sector. Um, well, I want to thank you both for providing us with such a good starting point. Um, give them an applause. And I know that you will both be working to address this in your organizations. Now, I want to welcome the next panel, and somebody needs to take away this table. Um, if you leave today without actually having learned anything, you cannot blame the panel. Um, I want to welcome on stage uh, an amazing team of experts. Uh, Joe Serrell. Um, welcome to Norway. It's always like this in January with snow and... <laughs> Uh, Joe is the Managing Director for Global Policy and Advocacy in the Gates Foundation, uh, one of the big, big contributors to global health work. Um, our next panelist is Camilla Stoltenberg. Welcome. She is the Director General uh, of the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. She's also a medical doctor and epidemiologist. Um, 
and the Norwegian Institute of Public Health works globally because health is a global issue. They have a number of projects and programs where they help build institutions uh, in middle and low-income countries. Then we have Heike Holmos, who has been... Minister of Development in Norway. He knows all there is to know about what a Minister of Development can do and cannot do. Um, we also have Kristin Ingsta Sandberg. She's a senior fellow. Please welcome her first. She's a senior research fellow at the, at the Fritjof Nansen Institute, where she studies global health governance, its interfaces with national politics, the emergence of international health as a foreign policy issue, and institutional design and effectiveness of global health institutions. And last but not least, Paul Fife. He is uh, the director of global health and education in Norad. <laughs> and he's also a medical doctor. So. The expertise is on board. Um, I want to start, and I think all uh, discussions on international <coughs> development should start with what works um, and, and, and what we've actually achieved. Um, and maybe you can start, Kristin, by maybe giving us the good news. What's, uh, what's the good news about global health? Well, the good news, as you started with, many of the arrows are pointing in the right direction, I think. And the other good news I want to mention is that I think over the past maybe 20 to 15 years, the world has come to terms with, uh, or the, <clears throat> the global health community has come to terms with, that we don't have to wait until we have solved the equity issues in countries before we start tackling the equity issues globally. So meaning we can both uh, work on health system strengthening and ensure that we lessen the gap between what, for instance, children in our part of the world have access to and children in East Africa have access to. So we're seeing that now, for instance, with uh, cancer medicines coming on national um, essential medicines lists in the global south. I think that signifies, that's good news. And I want to jump to, since this is about Norway's role in global health, so what's the good news for Norway? I think um, building over the past 20 years, what we are hearing outside Norway is that Norway has really achieved a lead position in global health internationally, among countries, among other actors, uh, including the found big foundations. Um, and I think... Taking a leadership role, what does that signify? It has been specifically on developing uh, new approaches to solving global health problems. And, and with new approaches, um, we are looking at issues that really are too complex for any actor to tackle on its own. And examples of, of, of such approaches are initially Gavi was that an approach. Um, uh, unit aid was that kind of approach. Uh, in the last few years, CEPI signifies that kind of approach. Um, to the point now where we hear that Norway has become a necessary actor to get things moving. And maybe perhaps the press conference uh, at the White House yesterday. For the f I don't know if it's happened before, that actually now the US is following Norwegian lead on an important policy issue, which is actually the case. Um, and so, um, so the, the approaches, I think we're really looking at some new models for handling what you talked to initially about the transformation of the health sector, right, is coming with the private sector. You know, there are some real challenges that are ahead of us in terms of tackling how do we deal with this sort of biotechnological revolution that's sort of upon us right now. And the Norwegian role which has not just been to pour funding into the system, which it has also does, but it has to do with, again, what we're hearing outside, that has to do with uh, being, being uh, this neutral broker, being a convener, being even a moral authority in bringing div a diverse set of actors together. Um, I believe that can, is useful now and it can become quite useful in the future. So it's, it's good news, I think. Uh, thank you. Well, Joe, since you're... Uh, <coughs> Part of the success stories some are mentioning. Um, 
what would you say are the biggest achievements and, and how we have we learned from past mistakes uh, in the work that we do on global health? Well, uh, first, I think I just want to acknowledge again, as, uh, as you did, <clears throat> it's really impressive at 8 in the morning to see so many people gathered around the issue of global health on, on a day where the weather isn't that uh, great. Although I really enjoy it. Um, <laughs> it's very impressive. And, and in terms of mistakes uh, as well, I, I realized for years um, uh, I've been calling Paul Fife, Paul Fife, who outside of this room is known in the global health and development world as Paul Fife. Uh, so it's good to come to Norway and get your pronunciation. Maybe I got it wrong. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. Um, Look, I, maybe we'll start with an anecdote. Um, Paul and I happened to be in uh, one of the highlights of my year last year was uh, <coughs> traveling to Mozambique uh, for a meeting of the investment committee of the global financing facility. Uh, and I, it was about 10 years uh, previously that I had a chance to, to travel to, to Mozambique. And there we had some really great uh, conversations at the time and Mozambique had an ambitious agenda to really invest in, in global health and work in a new way with some of the development actors. Uh, and I remember some of the conversations at the time. There was a, a, a meeting that Canada had convened with a lot of the uh, big donors that were working in, in Mozambique. And there was, there was a strong sense that uh, much of those uh, donors should be better coordinated, that we were hearing from the Ministry of Health at, uh, in, in Mozambique who was complaining that the, the, the monitoring and evaluation alone was, was taxing uh, her staff to the point that they really couldn't focus as much as they want on, on patients and on, on some of the outcomes. They were so busy on the administrative side of things. They wanted a, a national plan that really reflected their needs and not uh, just responding to the, the whims and the desires of, of donors. They wanted to crowd in additional private sector capital. Uh, they wanted to access and, and leverage more of the uh, financing they're receiving from the World Bank um, to, to program it into uh, to health. Fast forward 10 years later, uh, and I think this illustrates the, the point I was going to make on both the macro story, which is, I think, a very good one, but also Norway's role in that, and that's you have a, a, a new mechanism called the Global Financing Facility that Norway helped incubate and has been a, a big champion, and now others, other donors seeing the wisdom of, of this have come, in, come on board. And back into to Mozambique, we have now, and we had these presentations from a number of different health ministers who say there is an increased uh, um, uh, frequency of, of donors programming against one national health plan. There is uh, an ability to crowd in private capital. Uh, there, uh, we're seeing, I think, an, an immense amount of progress. Sometimes it's not as fast as, as, as what we'd like, but I, I think the statistics that you started with in the beginning, the fact that we've halved under five child mortality uh, since 1990, uh, the immunization, and, and again, one of the, the, uh, the principal mechanisms that has really helped both increase routine immunization but introduce uh, new vaccines as well, Gavi, has helped to save millions of, of lives. Uh, and we see it under in, in many um, uh, other uh, measurements as well, whether it's uh, malaria and the near two-thirds reduction in, in malaria deaths uh, since the, the, the MDGs. I think we're seeing progress, and people do forget that, that progress. We're all anxious to, to do more, and I think it, it's great to be critical. Uh, but let's not forget the, the progress that, that, that we have seen. I think um, sometimes good news is harder to appreciate than bad news. Uh, Bill Gates wrote in Time magazine uh, this month about the phenomenon of sometimes when you see a building that's uh, burning, people will rush to go report that. A story that less buildings burned last year is not a very compelling story, so you don't tend to, to read and see about it. So I, I, I do think there's a lot of progress. Sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to really appreciate and take stock of it. Mm. Thank you. I, I want to, um, now that we've had the uh, positive outlook, <laughs> to go into one of the issues that uh, were raised by the former panel, the, the bottom 400 million uh, that are not accessing health services. Um, and maybe turn to you, Camilla. What what's can we do to reach out to the poorest that we're not doing? Well, I think, thank you for inviting us. Now I actually think we have very good weather today, so I'm amazed <laughs> that people are here and they're, they're not out skiing already. <laughs> but um, 
I think that that is a very important issue, and it's hard to respond to that directly. So I'll be quite concrete in responding to that. I think the discussions that are now going on um, at WHO on uh, universal health coverage, how to define it and how to work on that, those discussions are very important for how one should approach uh, that issue of how to to, to um, develop services for uh, those who are not <coughs> accessing services today. Mm. Uh, but on a more concrete level, the national level, uh, what we are doing at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health is that we have funding from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs through NORAD uh, to work with four countries, Malawi, Moldova, Ghana and Palestine, uh, on developing their national public health institutes. Uh, and uh, some of them had institutions already that are being developed now, and others didn't have them in place at all. So that's a long-term commitment from our side in working with those four countries. And then through the International Association of National Public Health Institutes, IAMFI, we also work with other countries that are part of IAMFI so that they can develop the same kinds of twinning or partnership mechanisms and work with a number of countries, depending on what their capacities are. But these are very sort of modest, concrete, but long-term and significant kinds of investments. And uh, a major perspective in all of that is that we are doing this in order to strengthen uh, the health systems in each country. We are doing it to... Uh, well, to, to develop examples of how one can work on that at an international level. And no, we are doing it in order to emphasize the importance of uh, having data and evidence for each step that you take and to develop systems for uh, obtaining evidence that are efficient, mm -hmm. that are not too burdensome, uh, and that are integrated into the health services and the public health functions in each country. And that's extremely concrete, but very important. And it's long-term in the sense that, for example, in Pal Palestine, our efforts there and our partnerships there started about 10 years ago, depending on when you <laughs> start counting. But at least since 2012, we've been working on this. And it is going forward, but sometimes it goes to the side and it stops. And, and it's very difficult with lots of hurdles along the road. But when we look back to 2012 or 10 years back, there are significant achievements, and it is a major success, in fact. Mm. And I think we need to uh, promote those successes and, and tell the world about them, <laughs> not only Norway. I don't think they're sufficiently well-known in Norway, and I definitely don't think they're sufficiently well-known internationally, although uh, it was uh, a big moment to hear President Trump say yesterday that... Uh, the US is working with Norway on health and health security uh, and on vaccine development and health prevention or disease prevention. That is, I, I don't know amazing. what it will be. It is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're here all to celebrate that <laughs> statement actually from the press conference last night. That's an optimistic assessment of the press conference. Heike, uh, looking from sort of the, <laughs> the, the inside of, of, of prioritizing Norwegian development systems, what is it that we can do to, because this comes up in every sector, we're not reaching the poorest. Um, how can we do that? Oh, good. Just start out by saying that uh, one of the amazing things that I think uh, we're working with, uh, with people in Norway and working with Bill and Melinda um, uh, Gates Foundation uh, I think one of the amazing things that you learn is that if you have a combination of political will, mm. uh, a strong bureaucracy, uh, and also uh, flexibility and money to fund what you're doing, you are able to play uh, a leadership role in whatever sector where there is an opportunity. And that, I think, is a starting point, that if we, we see that uh, there, is, um, there is a lack of leadership in an area, there is an opportunity if you group these th uh, three things together. But mm. all is necessary. I mean, like, you can come there with, uh, with good bureaucracy and no political will, and you will fail. Right, that's uh, that's the fundamental, and the same if you lack the uh, lack the money. So I think that the combination here is is vital, and 
that's, uh, that's something that is important to remember. But the most important takeaway point is, uh, from my perspective, has been for all the, the years that I've been working with these issues, has been that inequality is the major, uh, what do you say, barrier to, uh, to the progress that we are making. Uh, why am I saying that? Well, if you look at the Human Development Report, like the latest one, they say that 22% of all we achieve is lost due to increased in, uh, inequality. Mm -hmm. Because there is an inequality, increased inequality, maybe not between uh, on, on the world as a whole. Different reports show different things here, but it's definitely happening in, 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 uh, in the individual countries. Mm -hmm. Now, since, since you're in Norway, I'd, I'd like to say, what does this mean in Norway, where actually inequality plays the least role in decreasing uh, the uh, human development that is uh, actually present? Well, it means that right across the river, in Grinalöka Bydel, uh, over the river, uh, in the uh, city area of Grinalöka, uh, there is a life expectancy of, uh, or a saga, you know, there is a life expectancy of nine years shorter than it is in the western part of, uh, of town for men. And it means that even though there is a progress in the years of 2008 to 2011 of increased um, uh, life expectancy, it was actually going down for men in Grinola Cabiral, just across the river, like a couple of hundred meters over, over here. And that's, uh, uh, that, is, that just shows how inequality and, what can you say, the, the political nature of, uh, of health differences uh, plays, uh, uh, plays a role and, and actually what kind of community you grow up in and what your background is plays an important role uh, to determine your, your health. Now, how do we, um, what does this mean to our policy making? Well, it means a couple of things. It means that, uh, that universality has to be core and key to any uh, healthcare system that you develop. And it's just like, uh, just like uh, the NGOs mentioned be, uh, be, uh, at the start of the meeting, if you don't have a political approach to developing a healthcare system that actually reaches those who are most marginalized, then it's not, a, it's not going to work and it, we're not going to achieve what we want to achieve. So starting out by saying we'll take 10 more percent and 10 more percent is not sufficient if you don't start by saying that we need a universal system that addresses the, uh, the uh, 10 most vulnerable percent. And this is, uh, I imagine, the same as, as you are saying with the approach that the WHO is, is taking. So that's, that's one thing that is important. And the other is that you have to address inequality in the system at the same time as you develop the inequality in the country. Because if you look at, for instance, countries like Nigeria, Angola, Tanzania, where there is a nearly 40% loss of human development, and also on, on the health side, due to inequality, uh, these are also countries that ha where, where money is accessible in the country, mm. but uh, where the growing inequality both leads to, uh, uh, to decreased health for those who are most, uh, most vulnerable, uh, even though the money exists in the society. And, uh, and that's why I say that it's so important that when you, uh, when you work together with a country on developing a healthcare program, vaccines, building up primary healthcare system, you have to have a strong responsibility from the country itself to back up with money and say and increase that backing up of, of money to make the system uh, sustainable in itself. And, and here I come, it's the, it's the last thing, because we've been working so strongly together on, on issues uh, like uh, contraception and, and in, 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 uh, on uh, immunization. I think it's so important uh, to understand that to make a healthcare system sustainable, like our achievements, for them to be sustainable, you need to put in place the last thing that is a primary healthcare system uh, that takes care of making the achievements sustainable. So if we only focus on the intervention, we will succeed now, but not succeed in the long run. Mm -hmm. And I think that the one from Norwegian perspective, I think that the evaluation that came from our Botswana, uh, uh, our, uh, our endeavors in Botswana, together with Botswana, shows very clearly that uh, our, the most success we had was going in on a long-term basis with a long saying that we are going to stay with you until you succeed, uh, be it on dental health care or, or be it on, on primary health care system, because then we were able to work together in a, in, a, in a way to get the systems in place. And I think that the evaluation also shows that 
that getting the primary healthcare system in place in a way based on their premises and based on, on their, their national plans what, uh, is, is, is what is the, the key success, uh, success story. And I can also say that we have actually one politician now in, in our, my party in parliament uh, who, uh, who grew up as part of that development program in Botswana. So he, he loves Botswana, of course, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and says that it, and it's so great to know that what you've been part of uh, is something that is sustained. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't would fall together uh, when you leave or, 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 uh, or take away the funding. I think, thank you, and I, and I think you moved us nicely into the second challenge that was raised, being institutions on the ground. Uh, maybe asking you, Paul, is there a trade-off between wanting results that are measurable in terms of child mortality or HIV AIDS or malaria on the one hand and building lasting institutions on the other where perhaps you won't see any results in 20, 30 years, mm. in your view? No, th thanks. I mean, first, I mean, some of the answers, or at least some opinions, um, on the past 15 years, uh, we felt that NORA had the need actually to document, to just write down things from mm. 2000 to 2015. And, and very clearly, I mean, uh, uh, we are today in a totally different situation than in 2000. And in 2030, we're going again to be in a totally different situation than in, let's say, 2015 or 20, 2018. So, I mean, clearly, there's, there's an evolution here. One thing about the global health community, which involves all of us and, and many more, is we have this, uh, shall we say, habit, perhaps culture, uh, of, uh, and Joe, what you said in terms of, and others not perhaps recognizing the successes enough, because there's always, shall we say, a, a, an intent to improve, and that, that creates healthy discussions. We're not always uh, in agreement, but extremely important here. Um, what we see as we move forward, and I think that's part of, of the narrative here, extreme successes. I mean, uh, the job is not finished. I mean, some people in this uh, room perhaps are not old enough to remember really the HIV and AIDS crisis. So on oh, sorry. Yeah. And um, 11 million people through the Global Fund alone, are on antiretroviral treatment. You cannot just stop it. Uh, Gavi, 9 million deaths averted, uh, halving and, and so on. These are specific interventions. If we hadn't had these interventions, we wouldn't have the success in global health. Did it build systems? In some ways, yes. Very focused systems on delivery and so on. Did it build national health systems, equitable, equitable, affordable, accessible? Probably not. Can it, as we move forward? That's a big question. And that's one of the policy questions which are coming up now as part of the SDG, mm -hmm. because what we're talking about, yes, successes, the global funds, global initiatives, global leadership has been extremely important. It will continue to be important, but if you're going to build a national health system, that needs to be done in country. So the 400 million people, they, will, they are living and will continue to live where there's war, conflict, where there's no peace. I mean, how do you build a, a health system when, when people are fleeing, when there is no government functioning, when there is war? So I mean, a large part of these people will be living in this area. It's a totally different discussion than having a long-term, uh, sustainable, even if we see that these things are merging. Mm. I mean, uh, the length of conflict, it just means that we need to look at, shall we say, humanitarian approaches in a longer-term, long-term perspective, and we're not good enough at that today, very clearly. Uh, the second thing, um, financing. Uh, you mentioned fine, going from funding to financing, yes. I mean, ODA is very important. It's going to remain important for the poorest countries, it's going to be, remain important and perhaps increasingly for global public goods. And in health, it's very clear the vaccine, market shaping, and so on is, is important. Um, I, epidemic preparedness responses. Um, but it's also very clear that uh, the big elephant in the room is national domestic resource mobilization. And, and if I would point to one thing 
that we have seen as an effect of the global initiatives, it has, and we have documentation on this increasingly and that we need to take into account, it has led to a reduction in domestic investment for health. It's totally natural. If you have a minister of finance that basically sees an opportunity, that person, he or she is going to divert it to another sector. So, so we need here to look a bit at how this is financed <coughs> and not forgetting either people themselves are paying out of pockets. 100 million people each year, and these are some of the 400, but also some that are falling back. 100 million people are getting, uh, are falling into poverty traps because of health, uh, catastrophic health expenditures. So I mean, th the great thing here, and just to, to move forward, um, the past 15 years, Norway has been part of this in terms of the political leadership. Uh, I think also standing on giant's shoulders, Tore uh, Godal, Sigrun Mørgedal, and so on, they have the same pronunciation in Norway as, in, uh, <laughs> uh, as abroad. I mean, it's clear that having a strategic outlook in terms of how do you wor work politically at the same time, it needs to be evidence-based, scientific, and so on. The, it is not easy to run a health system. It is not. I mean, so I mean, uh, the, so in addition to poverty uh, and inequality, as was said, uh, I would add stigma discrimination. It's something we must not forget. I mean, why have we not been able to do the same thing on contraceptive, reproductive health commodities and others on vaccines? Is it again women coming, shall we say? In, I mean, we work on it very systematically now, but it is interesting to see. Um, and the whole movement, we do think we see now a political institutional movement that starts coming together on health systems through universal health coverage. Mm. So uh, finding as we move, move forward the way of not cutting the good thing, so sustainability in terms of, I mean, it's great to see the US government continuing actually still to support the Global Fund and HIV and AIDS and so on. Uh, I mean, it's almost more scary to see what's happening in, in countries where the emphasis on prevention is, is, is not good enough. So we see an increase in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in, uh, I'll stop here. I'll <laughs> come back later. I'm sorry. Oh. One hour is much too short. <laughs> we could have invited you to talk for, for the full hour. Uh, Kirsten, you asked a comment and then. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I think um, I had a comment because I think it's important to remember when we talk about the success, and maybe we're a bit sort of on the success side in this panel, but it's important to remember that Gavi was definitely not a success the first five, six years that it was operating. It wasn't able to bring the prices down. There was a lot of question about which vaccines it was focusing on. A lot of debate. People really threw stones at Gavi, and I think that Norway sort of, or not, not just Norway, but Gavi and the other supporters kept, and even the Gates Foundation, <laughs> kept its stamina through that phase. I wonder if that would be possible today. Mm. Uh, there is this culture of demonstrating results really quickly in order to justify uh, financing. And I do think it's becoming also harder, as you say, Paul, to think strategically also as we have key individuals in Norway uh, reaching and an age where where they will be doing less, um, and also <laughs> except Paul, <laughs> but not Paul. <laughs> no, no. I think over the few others. I yes. mean, people are getting strong. I mean, it's yes, uh, that's yeah. true. That's true. Uh, but still, if we think ten years ahead, and also I think an important point that we shouldn't forget here is that where are sort of the bottom billion today are not necessarily in the traditional recipient countries. They are in the large middle-income countries. And how do you really sort of set the stage for the next 10 years mm. into that picture? Mm. I want to um, ask you, Joe, looking sort of from, from the outside, um, in all these needs and on the, on the back of all these successes, is there anything Norway can, can do that's particularly useful um, in these challenges, beyond, of course, funding. Yeah, yes, <coughs> and I would. A lot of it has to do with continuing to do what Norway has been doing. I, I think, as I mentioned, much of the successes that you can point to um, really have come from early investments in, in some of the institutions. Uh, those, even with with some startup troubles over over the years, uh, but that have improved uh, certainly. Um, 
and I think to, to be a pathfinder and a trend spotter for, for some of the emerging threats that we have. And I think CEPI is, uh, is, is a really good example of that. Uh, I would say that I, I'm very struck um, as, as I go around and, and, and as the foundation works in, in, in the area of global health, but not just health, at how much um, leadership beyond the financial commitment comes with, with uh, Norway's investment. And I would say that Norway plays an outsized uh, influence when it comes to helping to shape and, and improve some of the, the mechanisms and institutions that we've talked about. Beyond the money, there is the representation on the governance and the boards of many of these institutions that help uh, those organizations to grow. The, the white papers and the, and the emphasis that, that Norway places on, on policy research are hugely influential. They may not sort of, it may not appear to, that they see the light of day outside of, a, a, you know, of people that are really interested in that topic, but they are, they're incredibly useful in terms of helping organizations shape their future direction. Uh, we have found that the representation at, at the board level on many of these organizations is extraordinarily strong. And, and I think to continue pushing uh, on those things and those uh, efforts that work, but, but continuing to be a trend spotter uh, and, and finding those things and then using its influence to galvanize others, it's a great formula that, that, that really is working. And we're seeing a lot now, um, I, I can't overstate enough my enthusiasm for the global finance facility as the, the third leg of the, the stool, if you think about Gavi uh, on immunization and the Global Fund on AIDS TB and, and, and malaria, the GFF coming in as finally a, a, a financial mechanism that will support maternal child health with an emphasis on country-led health plans and health system strengthening. Mm. Thank you. I, I want to, uh, you mentioned the stamina and sort of sticking with it when even when results are not imminent. and. And Camilla, you mentioned your work where you sort of, you know, it moves forward and then it all moves backwards and then it goes to the sides. How do you, how do you actually build institutions? Because it sounds nice and important, but <laughs> what is it? Well, uh, I, there are others in this room can, <laughs> that can tell you more about that uh, or in more detail. But first, you have to get to know people and the country, and you have to have a relationship with. Uh, authorities and the government. Uh, and then you have to think about it as a true partnership. It's not th something that mm -hmm. you g go into a country and do. It's something that you develop together with people where you, you are actually supporting, negotiating, facilitating, not making decisions. Mm -hmm. But you can be extremely influential uh, in developing uh, how people think about a health system, what it is, but and you can also and you should also think about the sort of outside aspects, and not only the health system itself, but what it requires to develop a health system. And I think that was beautifully explained by our first panel in the sense that you need taxation, you need regulation, you need a society that functions in other ways also to do this in the long term. Uh, but of course, you can always build some kind of system. Uh, but under certain conditions, when there's war and crisis, it's the humanitarian side of it but even that should be, or should have a long-term perspective, sort mm. of moves towards uh, building a health system. Mm. And also you, you can provide the links with the international global level, with WHO and other institutions. And a last aspect that I would like to bring up is of course um, the, the whole issue about um, um, well, that it was uh, was explained as the relationship between the nation state and the private sector, mm. and that is a very complicated one, and it differs a lot between countries and over time. And I think that we need to develop concepts about how to deal with it, and both theoretically but also in practice, to see what what works, when is it good, and when does it not work? Mm. When does um, when is the state too weak? What do we know about that, Kirsten? When, when, when does institutional development work well? And, uh, and then Heike after. Well, I think um, when it works well, I think the, the, the test is over time. 
as you also suggest, Camilla, I think it's uh, often the uh, sort of outcome measures in terms of indicators on on progress on on, on sort of um, on co coverage, vaccine coverage, for instance. It's not it's not necessarily the best. I think it's. It's the commitment of stakeholders to that institution over time, which is probably the, the best test, I believe, for effectiveness when we talk about whether institutions are effective or not. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, two things. I, I think from from I, I think in all evaluation reports that I've written from uh, read from uh, from Nora, they they focus on a couple of things. They always say you need a long term perspective in what you're doing. Uh, you need to have a presence and you need to learn from what you've uh, done uh, right or wrong in, in, uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. but, and all evaluations from Nora had said that we are too bad at being long term uh, we, uh, and uh, we are too short term. Uh, we have too little presence and uh, we do learn too little from, uh, from what <laughs> we've done right and wrong in the, in the earlier sets. And this, this just shows me that, uh, this just tells me that, uh, that uh, one uh, a very good uh, paper uh, written by, uh, uh, by a competing uh, uh, think tank, uh, Cevita, um, uh, on the... On, uh, I've never heard of that. Uh, never heard of that, <laughs> no. <laughs> Irvin Agen, who is now, uh, now going to be the, uh, the chair of the Rainforest Fund, uh, for CEO of the Rainforest Foundation, shows that the way we've rigged uh, in uh, the Norwegian Development Corporation, right, the way we've rigged it, is in, a, in the absolutely most suboptimal way, uh, as a consequence of a compromise in the, in the last time we had a, a, a conservative government. Mm. So I think that the, the current uh, minister that has the responsibility for, for foreign policy and international development uh, should uh, do, do good. Uh, by saying that uh, having an uh, offentlig utvalg, uh, NOU, make an NOU, uh, on the like, fast-working uh, NOU on how should we learn from other countries and our previous experiences in rigging our development co cooperations so we can get more long-term, uh, more learning from what we are, are doing and get a greater presence at the places there, uh, uh, that we're actually operating. Because I think that would be a, that would be a good thing and that would uh, set some lasting, uh, what do you call it, footsteps, footprints, footprints. For, the, uh, for the future. It is a very good paper, actually. It is. Uh, good Paul thing you've gone from the right <laughs> way. Yeah. Paul asked to comment. Yeah, I, know. Uh, I mean, one of the great things last year was to get, I mean, now I'm back on the Norwegian scene, John, but you, you know it quite well. So, uh, great to see there is a cross-political, uh, shall we say, support for education and global health. <laughs> and that goes back, shall we say, to the also, it, it, it requires a sustainable, shall we say, long-term approach in terms of working with countries, having competencies and so on. The, there are no quick fixes. Um, uh, the second thing, the GFF, I mean, I totally agree with Joe in terms of GFF, and at the same time, sometimes I get, oh, GFF cannot be the response to everything. So, I mean, we, we'll have, uh, be it in February or March, a, a meeting around the GFF, the Global Financing Facility. One of the great things with the Global Financing Facility, it's, it's really countries are speaking up in, in a different way than that, that what we've heard in some of the other global institutions. And it's ministries of finance, ministries of health, also other sectors which are getting involved. And it's really interesting. And, and, and notching up the discourse on, on, on health uh, is, is, is really exciting to see now. So coming soon to a place near you. Um, <laughs> the third thing uh, on capacity and, uh, and so on, I mean, we, we are in, I mean, not only NORAD, many of you people, so we have decades of experience on capacity building, training. <laughs> I mean, a large part of ODA is being spent on this. We know that it's not working very well, and then sometimes it works really well. So, I mean, uh, what you said, Heike, yes, these are the key points. If I would say, I mean, in terms of health, we need to be able, um, and also Camilla, yes, Norway has know-how in health, uh, you know, health coverage and, and so on, in terms of working with countries, um, it is not only a technical fix. Uh, it, it, there is a political economy, and we know that we, we can create something for a few years and then it falls back quite quickly. So, I mean, this is not easy, and we need to work systematically on this. We are in NORAD, uh, thanks, I mean, to, to, to the government and the, the big support, uh, establishing this Kunstgasbanken, the knowledge bank. Uh, 
exactly to build on the successes we've seen in alpha development expanding to, uh, to renewable energy, uh, but also uh, in terms of scooping up or growing engagement in tax for development. Uh, statistics is part of that. Uh, gender is part of this. And, and see how can we, shall we say, become even better. Because what countries, developing countries, are asking for, it is not only funding, it is sharing of experiences. And back to the GFF, it's so interesting. We hear some of the solutions that we move forward coming from countries themselves. Mm. Big difference the past 15 years, there is capacity in many, many countries, local capacity. And, and they live there. I mean, it's, uh, I'm always struck by, should people come here and tell us about to how to build the, the Norwegian health system? <laughs> Perhaps not. But do we need to share? Do we need benchmarking? Uh, is Norway spending uh, the best krona per, 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 health, uh, per healthy life? I think we're moving, and that's the next notch, two net notches. Cross-sectoral work is getting much more important. It's another ball game. Really value the partnership with National Institute of Public Health. And the second thing, we've gone from access in terms of uh, also averting death compared with the education sector, where it's difficult to measure whether, shall we say, long-term engagement is working. In health, you die or you survive. <laughs> We're moving into the quality measure now. Mm. Much more difficult. So there are two areas in health systems, we, or three areas, we think are very important to continue. It's on data. So I, I do think it is very important uh, to work on data. And it is frag fragmented today. How are we going to move forward? Human resources for health. People, extremely important, large part of the budget. And the third thing is innovation, I, I, which, I mean, it's transforming societies and also the health sector and also empowering people. So, um, yes. I have two very quick comments from Christine and then Heike, and then I have a question for you all. Yeah, I was Just going to comment just very briefly on Heike in terms of the Norwegian role. And when we are trying to unpack this sort of notion of Norwegian leadership and also by interviewing abroad, what we hear, which is interesting, is that Norway is behaving a bit like a foundation. <laughs> and no offense, really. <laughs> but what does it mean? It has to <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with the flexibility with which the Norwegian government acts and, of course, the amount of funding. But it also does bring up some questions about how we debate global health in Norway. Do we have enough transparency? You know, how is decisions being made? I think it's, it's also important to look at that when we sort of plan for the next mm. 20 years. Thank you. Uh, are we as, uh, transparent enough? Do we have a big debate? No, we don't. Uh, fortunately, we are here instead of skiing in the Nordmarka and uh, Lillemarka and Östmarka, but, but still there is too little transparency in the decision, uh, decision making. What that has given is the Minister of Development, we being responsible for development, enormous flexibility in, uh, in, uh, in making decisions that goes in, uh, in different ways. So in, uh, in a way, the, the lack of debate, if I can be as blunt, the lack of debate in the parliament on many of these issues, uh, other than being supportive in, uh, in us taking a leadership role, gives an enormous flexibility for Norway, you say, to behave as a foundation. So there are ups and downs with, uh, with everything. Uh, but uh, I was going to comment on the, on the final thing, and I think on, on where can we be innovators. And I think that from, uh, I think it's important to draw what you said, uh, uh, FIFA, um, uh, that look at what, uh, what we are doing if you increase the spending like from the international community, you can actually deliver decreased spending from individual countries. And that is, uh, that is something, that's, uh, that's something that we should bring with, uh, bring with us in further development. So I think that we can be innovators on health equity. I think that uh, on both the financing and on the cooperation side, we can play a role because we can actually, coming from where we are, being a fairly equitable society uh, and, uh, uh, and having the experiences that we, we have. Um, I think it's possible to actually, with, what you say, with, uh, with pondus, with, uh, uh, I don't know how you say with that. With authority. It, it, it's a, huh? With some authority. Yeah, so with some authority, say that, look, uh, I think this is a perspective that's important to bring in. Now, what have we learned? 
We have learned, for instance, on, on, on education side. In, in Zambia, where we spent money on improving the tax authorities' ability to draw in uh, tax revenues from the copper mining uh, and the copper industry, uh, they increased their income with exactly the same amount of money that they increased their spending on education. Because people in countries, they demand healthcare, they demand education. So if you, have the uh, if you have more money, you will actually spend it on these issues that we are spending, uh, that, that we are interested in countries spending money on. But that means also that if we go in and have money and put money on the table and say, we will, we will back you up in, uh, in, uh, in relieving your, uh, your problems, um, uh, then you will al must always commit on, on your own side in, in developing this to avoid our money crowding out the, the local money. Uh, money and in a way uh, in, by that increasing the inequality in the country uh, because the money can go to kleptocrats instead of going to the people. Mm. Great, we need to wrap up. I want to, uh, the SDG3 was mentioned earlier and I want to ask you all to just answer yes or no to the following question. Uh, it says SDG3 and let's disregard the 2030 targets for now. Ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Is it within reach, Paul? Yes or no? <laughs> it would be a scandal if I said no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, definitely, but it's, it's going to be harder work even than the MDGs. Um, uh, but yes, uh, I would uh, say progressively. A lot of what we're talking about is progressive realization of rights and, and moving to... And, and for all countries. I'll take that as a yes. Yes. <laughs> Justin? Uh, I'm sorry, but no. Heike? No. Oh, we can't say anything else than yes. <laughs> Camilla? Yes. Joe? A definitive yes. That's uplifting. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for helping us understand complicated issues. Thank you to... Uh,